actual uh, Garden of Eden, uh, that it has had to shutter factories and abandon major energy pro uh, projects there. It also has terrible, terrible water pollution. Some 300 million people are drinking unclean water, and two of three cities are suffering severe shortages. They only treat about one-fifth of the wastewater versus about four-fifths in advanced industrial countries. Uh, to buy time for what is an, a, a, a looming national water crisis, of which they are very aware, I may add, <clears throat> they are building the largest water project on Earth, uh, a series of huge aquifers, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of aqueducts that are going to transfer water from the wet south over mountains, under, under rivers, uh, to, the, to the north uh, region, uh, at least on a, on a continental scale through earthquake zones that make what California has uh, look like... Look like uh, a tinker toy set. Um, then there are the effects of climate change. While Washington insiders have been wargaming the national security risks from global warming for several years, they are only now beginning to connect the dots to the water crisis. I, I kind of think of the climate change crisis as really the water crisis in hyperdrive. After all, climate change wreaks most of its damage by increasing the variability and the extremity of water-related shocks, such as what are they? Droughts, floods, mudslides, hurricanes, rising sea levels, melting glaciers, diminishing snowpacks. And what do these shocks do? They overwhelm and they wrong size existing water infrastructures that were built for traditional weather patterns. Uh, it is predicted that there are, going to be, there are about 25 million what, what we're calling today climate shock or environmental refugees today in countries that, um, in places where people have lost their livelihoods uh, because of these. Um, uh, mostly water-related uh, uh, devastations. There are expected to be something on the order of 150 million environmental refugees, really water refugees, wandering within and across borders uh, in the coming years. If I only impart one lesson, a policy lesson today, I hope it's this, that the water crisis is not a standalone challenge. It's inextricably interlinked with three other great looming challenges that are facing mankind in the 21st century. For food shortages, energy shortages, and climate change. These four really form a quadrangle, a four-sided rubric cube, if you, for those of you who can remember those, uh, of policy challenges where the changes in one affect the outcome of the others. And it is this coming generation's great challenge to solve that rubric cube. Now, while Boutros Ghali's predictions of water wars have mostly not come true, um, the grave looming danger today is from, from water scarcity is from failed states. Water scarce states that cannot produce enough food, energy, and goods or shield themselves against the uh, water uh, weather-induced disasters are much more prone to fail. And failing states become breeding grounds for the international terrorism, regional conflicts, and the epidemics and diseases, mass migrations that will reverberate across borders. Now, the mother of all failed state nightmares for the United States is Pakistan. It's a critical ally in the war in Afghanistan. It's home to Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. It's nuclear armed. And it's a hair, a hair trigger alert with its arch enemy, arch enemy and also nuclear armed neighbor, India, with whom it has fought three wars and has today very serious water disputes. And even before this summer's tragic floods, its leaders were urgently warning U.S. diplomats that the country had all the elements of an incipient water scarcity catastrophe, soaring population, crumbling irrigation infrastructures, dysfunctional governance of its water structures, insufficient hydropower, storage, regular blackouts, even riots over lack of clean water on a regular basis. But most alarming, they warned American officials that they'd soon be unable to feed their teeming populations because for decades, Pakistan has stayed ahead of this food security curve by pumping groundwater. But now the tube wells that, they've been, uh, that they drilled are now hitting bottom. Its lifeline river, the Indus, has already maxed out for irrigation. And now, catastrophically, it faces the prospect of shrinking flows in that river because 50% of its waters originate in Himalayan, Himalayan glaciers that are starting to melt. So Pakistan faces a 50% population increase while its main water source is going to diminish in the coming decades. And to make, waters, make it more explosive, the Indus tributaries first pass through India, 
which is building scores of hydropower dams for its own electricity needs on some of those um, tributaries. The Pakistanis are paranoid, and uh, that's not too strong a word, that India will use the cumulative one-month storage in these dams as a water weapon against it by withholding it during the crucial planting season. And Pakistani headlines routinely accuse India of practicing water terrorism against it. And most ominously of all, uh, the Muslim fundamentalist uh, terrorists in Pakistan who carried out that horrific Mumbai uh, bombing attacks in 2008 have glommed onto the water issue, and they've warned that thirsty Pakistanis will drink the blood of India, and they have the ability to carry out those attacks. Now, none of this might matter quite so much, but Pakistan has built only 30 days, a mere one month worth of storage capacity on the Indus to protect itself against droughts and floods. It's just an egregious governing failure. Uh, with the devastation wrought by this summer's floods, and that affected f- some 15% of the population and ruined a lot of cropland, uh, it may be, it looks like we're going to find out, but they may indeed be pushed over the brink uh, towards a, a collapse. Now, one water famished, impoverished, already failing state, uh, often in the headlines these days, is Yemen. Uh, it's so dry that farmers have had to abandon the land and are crowding into the cities, where water tables are also plunging. It is expected, is predicted, that within five to ten years, its capital city will ha- be the first city in the world to literally run out of water. Uh, it is a front line, of course, in the war on terrorism. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Gulf, Gulf has taken root there in the ungovernable regions, often, by the way, winning hearts and minds by, by digging wells uh, for the locals. Um, and the major reason that the United States can't close the Guantanamo Bay prison, as we, as we would like, is that half of the 200 prisoners there are Ye- Yemeni, and they would simply be rejoin the terrorist ranks if they were repatriated to that country. Look, history teaches us that there's going to be a difficult adjustment period that lies ahead, just as it has whenever population levels and key resources have gotten unsustainably out of balance. Those societies that make the nimblest adaptations and invent the best new paradigms to meet the water challenge are likeliest to emerge as world leaders, while those that fail to do so are likely, more likely to be overtaken and to uh, decline. Uh, quite frankly, most societies in the world are not addressing the challenges head-on, but instead, at best, are trying to buy time with temporary fixes like water pipeline transfers and the mining of groundwater. In the, hope, in the hope that some new technology will arise to solve the problem for, for them. But none of the hope for silver bullet technologies, desalination or genetically modified low water using crops, are likely to arrive in time or be able to be built out in scale to cover the growing shortfalls in the, inter- in the intermediate period. Don't get me wrong, there will be Nobel Prizes won for whomever invents things like renewable energy source to power desal or breakthrough in membrane technology and certainly for the engineers of the new gener- genetically modified crops that will drive the world's next green revolution. But, uh, and in the long run, these will likely be part of the answer to solving the water crisis. But for now, in the short and the intermediate run, the time in which we must live our lives and which po- politicians must make uh, the decisions, the best although the toughest path to meeting the global water crisis is by boosting the productivity and the environmental sustainability of our existing water resources using current technologies and uh, by reforming our current practices. It is doable uh, in theory. (laughs) The United States, too, is suffering shortages that are impeding our economic growth. We're not aware of it, but it is. And it is also fueling rising political tensions, which we are becoming aware of. Of course, the arid southwest is at the limits of our sustainable water availability. Uh, You all know here that Lake Mead on the Colorado is at such record lows that the hydroelectricity at the Hoover Dam has been scaled back by 33%. And if it falls much further, uh, and I must say the long-term predictions are that the Colorado is going to suffer a 20% decline in its flows, um, it will trip an emergency compact of cutbacks across the entire basin leaving cities like Las Vegas high and dry and Arizona very hard-pressed to continue growing. Uh, There are going to be knock-on effects here in Utah as well, as some of you uh, we were discussing outside. Uh, Las Vegas is um, trying to build a pipeline that is going to draw water from uh, right right along the border here in in, uh, Utah and um, 
uh, from an aquifer underneath the ground, and if it goes through, uh, that, that area may very well turn into a very drier uh, uh, dust, dust bowl. And some of, those, that, some of the dust may indeed, uh, you may feel that here in Salt Lake when the winds blow. Uh, so these things are all connected. The ecosystems are all linked to each other is part of this point. And Lake Mead, the, the ecosystem crisis brewing in the, um, uh, in, in the California Delta, uh, these are simply canaries in the mine shaft that are forewarning us of dangers that lie ahead if we don't act now. Uh, in Colorado, I was talking to a state water planner that told me uh, that due to the competition for water, projections are that without any changes, that 75% of their farms will disappear as farmers are going to be selling out their water rights to energy, industry, and cities that can pay more for it. Uh, that will denude the countryside uh, and not to mention reducing U.S. food production. So there are many policy issues to take into consideration here. But it's even in rainy, rainy, rainy parts of the United States, water, is also, water use is also exceeding precipitation. The southeastern states had a long, unusual drought, and Georgia was so desperate that it tried to move its state line one mile so that it could abut the Tennessee River and draw water from, from that river. That, of course, didn't fly. Uh, Parts of, of Florida, too, are straining their groundwater resources. Um, the, um, t- Texas right now is, is, has been draining for years its share of the Great High Plains Aquifer, which is a huge lake uh, that basically it's underground filled with rocks and, and debris and such um, that is about the size of Lake Huron. This, this water, when we began to pump this water out of this, uh, um, this aquifer, we were able to transform the dust bowl into one of the great cornucopias of the world. But that water is, is not replenishable. Uh, so you, you, if you use it up, it's going to be gone. They're in parts of Texas, they're pumping that water out now and want to pump more and bring it to the cities in the, uh, the east. Uh, they've also had schemes in, the, in Texas to, to, draw, to draw water from the Mississippi and the Great Lakes. But it won't happen in the Great Lakes because in 2008, the uh, Congress ratified the Great Lakes Compact, which is going to prohibit the exportation of... Um, of Great Lakes water outside of the Great Lakes Basin. All this, um, is, is, in short, is to, is, is to say that we are creating a new politics of water even here in the United States. Yet on a global scale, the United States is one of the water richest countries in the world. We have 8% of the world's freshwater resources, only 4% of the population. In fact, water is one of America's great comparative economic advantages in the 21st century. The $64 million question is, will we recognize it and will we fully exploit our water resource advantage? If so, I maintain that we have a golden opportunity to produce much of the water-intensive energy, food, and goods that will be increasingly demanded by an increasingly thirsty world. And in the process, we can help relaunch our economic growth, enhance our, our international influence, and help avert some of the worst looming national security and, human, uh, and human, humanitarian consequences uh, among the waters, the planet's water have-nots. But to seize this opportunity, we need a paradigm shift and a political and economic change that transforms how we manage water in this country. Now, most people don't realize it, but there have been some good, um, uh, unprecedented, and hopeful things already happening in the United States. Consider this. From 1900 to 1975, water use in the United States grew three times faster than population. But in response to the growing scarcity of water and the environmental laws of the 1970s that effectively imposed an environmental sustainability cost on some users, uh, industries, power companies, and cities have sought and found innovative ways to uh, to save money by using water more efficiently. The result is remarkable. We are using 30% less water per person uh, than, um, than we did uh, 25 years ago. Water productivity, water per unit of GDP, has risen dramatically. And this is not just in the United States, this is happening across the industrial world. But the truth is that we've only barely scratched the surface of what is possible, and in fact, what is necessary for our continued prosperity. Consider these huge opportunities. Non-point source polluters, notably agriculture, are scarcely regulated at all. Vast volumes of water is lost to evaporation by farmers who practice inefficient flood irrigation that never reaches the crop roots. 
and unnecessarily adds polluting fertilizers and pesticides to waterways that then must be cleaned by cities and other users downstream when there are more efficient irrigation technologies readily available. NASA has